My name is Pascal. I'm 22 years old now, but this event happened three years ago when I was 19. It happened in the middle of the night when my parents were away for an important company meeting. The company was kind of far away from where we lived, so I stayed home by myself while they were gone. One time, while I was at home alone, I looked out the window, randomly, and froze. There was a tall man, almost dressed entirely in black. He was wearing a tuxedo and holding a kitchen knife. This guy was standing right outside of the door, looking at me. He wasn't laughing at all, and his head was twitching continuously. Sir, please get off our property, otherwise I'll call the police. I opened the window and told him. Then the man replied, Oh, you can do that if you want, as long as you don't look away. Because of this strange attitude, I felt anxious, so I grabbed my cell phone and called the police. But when I looked out the window again, he was gone. At that very moment, I heard footsteps coming from downstairs. I suddenly remembered that I forgot to lock my garden door, so it was still open. I thought I was going to die at first, but then I pulled myself together. I got my bat and looked down the stairs, slowly trying not to make a sound. There he was. He was just staring at me. He didn't move but said, I told you not to look away. A few moments later, we heard sirens. The man still did not move. But then he suddenly changed his mind and walked over to me. I tried to swing my bat towards him, but I was so scared. I couldn't do anything except scream. The police broke down the door. One policeman tried to arrest him and the other one tried to take the knife away from him, but the man resisted. He was strong. Even though he was outnumbered, they couldn't stop him. They threatened to shoot him in the foot, but he didn't care. Furthermore, he attacked the two policemen and they tumbled down to the ground. I ran to one of the rooms and slammed the door shut, but he kicked in the door. When the door opened, I could see his face and I will never, ever forget that moment. However, at that very moment, the police caught up to him and shot his foot. The guy started screaming in pain. Shortly after that, he managed to jump outside of a window and disappeared. The policemen chased after him, but unfortunately, they failed to arrest him. I never saw that guy again. I'm glad that I survived that incident, but I also feel nervous that he'll come to my house again. From that day on, I always made sure I locked all the doors and windows. When I was a teenager, I would often explore the deep web with my friends, specifically weird stuff on the hidden wiki. There were definitely a lot of links to choose from. I never clicked on the violent links because I'm not into that. My friend Latrice told me to click on one that says new best friend. After doing so, it takes you to a page where you have to make a profile. I put the name Lisa on my profile. My real name is Susan. Once I made the profile, you are directed to a main page that has categories. They were silly, serious, smart, and smothering. We click smothering. I thought it was funny. After choosing, there was a list of people with their pictures, male and female. I clicked on the profile of a guy that had the name five, like the number five. I entered and it didn't seem like someone who would be a smothering friend. When I was searching through his profile, I received a message from him asking if I were looking for a friend. I looked at Latrice and she laughed, but also told me to respond yes. So we're messaging back and forth for maybe 30 minutes and then Latrice had to go. I told him I'll be back on tomorrow and he said okay. Maybe a week went by where I would talk to him every night. He seemed very nice so we exchanged numbers so we could talk more. Everything seemed fine until I clicked on another profile and someone else messaged me. I started talking with this other person but still was texting the guy five which I knew his real name now as William. The new guy 
had the name Bill on his profile. A day went by and he seemed cool, but then William randomly asked me why I was talking with Bill. I didn't know what to say, so I never responded. He kept texting with angry messages, so I blocked him. I didn't receive any texts, only a single message on that site, and it said soon. One day after school, my friend Latrice came over to have a sleepover. We got comfortable, went to my room, and did our usual of surfing through the web, being nosy. I brought up that guy. Then I received a text message that said, Why'd you block me? From a random number. I replied with a question mark. Then he replied, it's me, William. He texted me from another number after I blocked him. I told Latrice how creepy this guy is. Then Latrice stopped me from talking because she thought she heard something. Then I heard a voice. I'm not that creepy. We both responded by screaming and looking around. I saw someone coming from under my bed, so we ran screaming out of my room, and my mother called the cops. They didn't get him because he left through my window, and nothing could be traced back to him. I'm starting to think that he was both of the people I was talking to. That definitely opened my eyes to the dangers of the internet. I would never visit the dark web again. A few years ago, me and my family went on our yearly holiday to Madeira, which is the birthplace of my parents. It was pretty normal for us to go annually, as our grandparents were living there. We would sleep in one of our grandparents' home, and during the day, we would go to festivals. If you do not know much about Madeira, then this story will probably give you a better idea. It's not that a physical thing occurred that holiday. It was just this nightmare that became very real for me as a child. As I said before, I was staying at my grandparents' house while in Madeira. I had a room to myself on the upper floor. It was pretty creepy since my grandmother loved Victorian-style dolls. Once I was able to fall asleep, I had a creepy dream that I can't forget. I woke up, and from my bed, I could hear movement on the floor. I looked down to see that the floor was covered in black insects, just crawling around. I could not see the almond brown wood floorboards, and began to yell for help. Someone opened my door, and I saw my little brother come in, but behind him was a woman in a hideous purple dress. I never saw this woman before, but before my brother even came closer to me, I saw the woman force her hand into his back and tear out his heart. I remember screaming in the dream and all the woman said was, Your parents aren't here. And I woke up. I was so scared that I went into the next room where my brother should have been asleep. But because it was dark, I couldn't see him. Well, I was a dumb kid. My anxiety level rose even higher. I ran out, went downstairs, and none of my parents were around. I started to panic more because of what that lady in my dream said, and I started to cry even more. <laughs> then I heard my older brother call my name from up the stairs. Hey. The stairs I just ran down. I told him I had a bad dream, and he stayed in my room. After showing me that my little brother was snoring away in his bed. The next morning, my brother told my parents how I behaved, so my mother asked me what happened. I told her about the dream with the lady in the hideous purple dress. My mother's face became serious, and she looked worried. I didn't know why, since that was unusual for her. About two years later, I was going through my parents' wedding album in our home in Madeira, while I was sorting out the top floor of the house with my younger brother. I noticed that one of the pictures was ripped in half. I thought it was unusual, so I began looking through to see where the other half was. It wasn't in the album. I brushed it off. About an hour later, I was going through one of the drawers in the living room cabinet. 
I saw this picture of a woman in a purple dress. She looked almost identical to the woman in my dream. It was the same dress. I began to get goosebumps, so I put the album on top of a table and opened it to the page with the teared up picture. I began to shiver once the tear of both pictures fit perfectly well together. With worry, I began to ask my mother who was in the image. All I know to this day is that she is perceived as a witch and fled with my maternal uncle from Madeira soon after the whole community began to believe it. This is possibly all just a coincidence, but it does send a shiver down my spine. I've never met this woman, but she appeared in my dreams. I have no idea on whether or not I will forget the specific details of that dream, especially since I found out more about this woman, who is my aunt-in-law. This happened about five years ago. I was 11 years old and it was pretty early in the morning. I was in the backyard playing basketball with my younger brother before I headed to school. We had a basketball hoop in our backyard. Our backyard was located next to an alley and our gate was pretty short, so anyone who walked through that alley could see right into our backyard. After playing for a bit, we noticed that two strange men in the alley were checking out our neighbor's backyard. I didn't feel safe around them, so I led my brother back into the house. We were going to ignore them, but after eyeing them a little longer, my suspicion about them turned out to be right. Watching them from the window, I saw one of them hop right over our tiny gate and was now in our backyard. Then we rushed to go tell our mom. My mom went straight outside to see two strangers standing in our backyard. She yelled at them angrily and told them to go away. She called 911, but they ignored her and didn't leave. One of the men just stared at us. All of a sudden, he went into the shed we had in the backyard and pulled out a lawnmower that was inside. At first, we were all confused and we thought they might be trying to steal it. Then my sister started to record the incident, thinking it might scare them, make them run away, but it didn't work. My mom called 911 and the men weren't saying anything to us. But one of them seemed to have changed his mind and was trying to convince the other man that they should just leave. Then the man who pulled the lawnmower out of the shed turned the lawnmower on. We were totally confused at that moment. A random stranger just comes into our backyard and completely ignores everything we say to him. Why would he go into our shed, pull out a lawnmower, and turn it on? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. However, his next move made even less sense and was even more insane. He flipped the lawnmower upside down and just stood there looking at it. A few seconds later, our confusion soon turned to horror after watching what happened next. He dived headfirst into the spinning blade of the lawnmower, which cut his neck wide open and ended his life. All this happened in the blink of an eye. My mom screamed at the top of her lungs, which frightened the 911 operator. I couldn't believe what I just saw. I was only 11 years old at the time, but it must have been even harder for my younger siblings to watch that happen. A few minutes later, the ambulance and the cops arrived in the backyard. The police came by to ask a few questions, but the video my sister took had the whole incident on video. So the cops knew the story was legit. I couldn't help but feel bad for the other man that was with him. When the incident happened, he screamed too, started crying and begged us to call for help. But it was already too late. I didn't go to school that day because I was in shock. After that, I couldn't sleep at all. I had nightmares for a while. I wished we'd never saw that and wondered what happened to that man to make him want to end his life. I also couldn't stop thinking about our lawnmower. It was old and worn out. You needed to pull the cord multiple times, and with some luck it might turn on. But he pulled that thing once and it started right up. Everything was odd that day. This happened to me when I was 17 years old. 
I live in Canada, and this situation took place during a snowstorm at around 9 p.m. It was extremely dark outside, and I was waiting inside a bus stop shelter after my part-time job to get home. Although I live in a crowded city in Toronto, it was very quiet that night, and there were barely any cars on the road due to hazardous weather conditions. I was waiting all by myself for about 10 minutes until one man who looked like he was in his 50s entered the shelter. He had a disgusting smirk on his face, which made him a bit creepy looking, and that pretty large guy started making small talk with me. He had a creepy low voice and he kept asking me what I was doing out in this weather and where I was going. I was feeling anxious, but there was only me and that man, so I told him I was going home after work. He smiled and said to me that the buses are going to be delayed because of the weather and won't be coming in for a really long time. I took out my phone to check the bus times. However, due to the deadly cold weather, my phone died completely. Then he came closer to me. He smelled awfully disgusting. Hey, you want to come with me for five minutes? He said. I said, I'm sorry, sir. What do you mean? He said, let's go hang out for a bit. Don't worry, you won't miss your bus. I will bring you back safely. Come on. I wasn't stupid and was aware of pedophiles, so I stepped back and refused, but he kept insisting that I should go with him. I was so afraid that he would do something bad to me. However, luckily, one lady came into the shelter and the man immediately closed his mouth. After waiting for some time, the bus finally arrived. It was me, the lady, that creepy man, and two other people on the bus. He sat all the way at the back of the bus where he could watch me clearly, and I noticed that he kept staring and staring. I was so nervous, and when it was my stop, I got off along with the lady, and as I kept walking, I saw that the man got off with us and was right behind me. I freaked out and thought there was no choice at all, so I grabbed the lady's arm and asked her if she could walk me home because a man was following me. She also noticed that the guy was acting strangely, so she whispered that she would take me home. I walked with the lady, and when I looked back, he stared at me for a while and disappeared. When I arrived home, my parents and I thanked that lady repeatedly, and after that, I never saw him again in my life. I work as a nurse in a hospital, although I can't reveal exactly where because of privacy reasons. Recently a fairly popular celebrity came to be treated here, although I can't reveal who due to the aforementioned privacy reasons. Honestly, I was pretty surprised he was coming here. Not to shit talk my place of employment, but this place has a bit of a record of being really bad in caring for people. Not that I'm a bad nurse or anything, it's just that a lot of the surgeons seem to fuck up their job and not get fired for some reason. This made it all the more confusing to me that this celebrity came here for surgery to remove a late stage brain tumour. Speaking of, my friend Patricia was a huge fan and really wanted to be the one assigned to him post-surgery. She was even thinking of asking him for an autograph, which seemed unprofessional to me. Anyway, he was flying in for treatment tomorrow, but my current job was to assist a surgeon with the surgery of a little boy who swallowed a bunch of his toy marbles. I was surprised they decided to opt for surgery though, because they were previously recommended to wait for him to pass them. It was me, the anesthesiologist, and the surgeon in the room. I was staying nearby to the site of the surgery, and everything seemed to be going well. Then, the surgeon slipped and cut the kid's stomach lining open. It was horrific. The smell of stomach acid almost made me vomit as it began to dissolve his intestines. Despite our best efforts, he was dead within 10 minutes. 
What disturbed me was how unfazed the surgeon was. After we failed to save him, the surgeon left to break the news to the parents almost immediately after. I thought I heard the anesthesiologist mumble something under her breath, but I couldn't understand clearly. It was something about food. My shift was over though, and I walked to the subway to grab some dinner then caught the bus home. I was pretty tired so I watched some Netflix in bed until I fell asleep. That night I had a dream, or more accurately, a nightmare. I was in the hospital, and that kid was there in front of me. Only his whole body was hollow and his chest cavity was open and bloody. His eyes were gone too, but still he stared at me and the entire time he pointed straight down. I finally woke up and with relief from being free of that dream and more guilt from the failed surgery, I started my day. I got to work and Patricia was fairly bubbly. She spent almost the whole morning talking my ear off about the celebrity. When he finally came in, she started freaking out and tried to walk up and talk to him. His bodyguards pushed her away though and she returned to her duties dejectedly. Just before my lunch break, I was called into my supervisor's office. He said he had something very important for me to do and that it needed to be done ASAP. He told me to go to the transplant center and get 10 hats, then go to the basement. I was pretty confused and wanted to ask some questions, but he cut me off and yelled, Either you can do this shit right now, or you can walk out and kiss your job, good boy. I was pretty pissed. He would fire me daring to ask a question, but the management would avoid firing the incompetent surgeons even though they should. I left in a huff to go collect the organs and found them waiting in a case there already with a note signed by the doctor that gave me access to a restricted room in the basement simply called Room 60. I didn't have the slightest clue what was in there and matched onwards to the elevator and went down to the basement. I walked to Room 60 and showed the security guard my note. He looked me over and said, Oh, this is your first time doing this, huh? I feel sorry for you. Try not to panic if you know what's good for you. He then unlocked the door, and I stepped in. Immediately I was hit with a smell I would describe as rotten eggs, pennies and a corpse. The ground was slick with something and it was dark in there too, with only one dim overhead light. The room was pretty big, and in the middle I saw some nondescript blob. Then I heard what sounded like a deep breath in, and the blob started moving. The thing, which I now started to realise was a body, was walking towards me with stumpy, fat legs. I screamed and tried to run away, but I slipped on the ground. As my face got smeared in it, I realised the stuff on the floor was blood, and as I turned onto my back, I was face to face with the thing. It looked like a very pale, morbidly obese man although it was much taller and much fatter than any human could be. It had large curled horns, as well as no mouth. Instead, where its mouth should be, there was just a row of pitch black pointy needle-like teeth surrounding a hole. It paid me no heed and reached out to pick up the box of organs. It opened the box and ate all the hearts in handfuls, stuffing three at a time in its mouth. I was terrified and ran out the door, slamming it shut behind me. The security guard looked me in the eyes and put a reaffirming hand on my shoulder. It looked like he wanted to say something but couldn't. He told me that he would walk me out of the building and that I could have the rest of the day off. Now I'm at home, still shaking and typing this up. I got a text from Patricia and apparently the celebrity's surgery was a massive success. I'm wondering what I even do now. Is this the type of thing I can report? Would anyone believe me? This happened when I was about 11. My two friends and I, all of us male, were swimming in my friend's backyard one night around 10 p.m. My friend's house borders the junior high school property and is separated by a chain-link fence. As we were swimming, I look over and I see a tall man dressed in black and a baseball cap just standing there like a zombie just watching us. For some reason, I didn't get scared. I just thought he was weird. I mention him to my friends, who both look over and immediately start screaming their heads off and start swimming away to get out of the pool. Their reaction woke me up to the situation, and I started swimming out of the pool too. We are one by one trying to use the ladder, and I was in the rear so as I'm waiting, I look over and the guy is scrambling up the fence as fast as he can. We made it to the house and managed to slam the door and lock it just as he reaches the door. This was the back door, which was like 80% clear glass, so he just stood there looking at us as we screamed our heads off. I even noticed he was holding a baseball bat. We run and hide behind the living room couch, and he keeps jiggling with the doorknob. But luckily, he never used the bat to break the glass, which would have been really easy. 
He walks away and my friend runs and turns the security alarm on and calls his dad who was off running errands. My friend's dad said he was almost home and to stay inside. We turn the TV on and start to calm down, when all of a sudden, the alarm goes off. I almost shit my swimming suit for the second time, and our stupid 11 year old minds decide just standing there screaming was the best option. My friend's dad happened to get home while this is happening. He gives the operator the secret password that everything is okay, grabs his gun and searches the property, but he didn't find anyone. We still swam at night after that, and we never met that crazy guy again. Also, I'm 25 now, and I don't know why we didn't just call the cops or why my friend's dad didn't call the cops. This happened around the year 2011, when I was 13. One day my friend was planning on throwing a party at his place, so my older cousin drove me there. It took about four hours to get there, and when I finally arrived, it was around 8 p.m. A few hours later, we were having fun, but out of nowhere, I had to use the bathroom really badly. About five minutes had passed, and while I was in the bathroom, I heard a crunching noise coming from the woods. At first, I thought it was someone who arrived late to the party, but all of a sudden, I heard loud banging on the glass. I started to think it might be my friend just looking for me. So I told him that I was inside the bathroom. However, it wasn't my friend. It was a guy who looked like he was in his late 50s. He said that his car broke down. He then asked me to help him, but I was already paranoid about strangers. So I simply told him that I couldn't help him. He nodded his head and walked away. When I was done using the bathroom, I went back to the room where my friend was. I told him what I saw and what the man said to me. My friend looked like he just saw a ghost. Then he finally said that for almost two months, this man was stalking his entire family and also saw him from the bathroom window tons of times. They asked the police to check their area several times, but they couldn't help his family. When he said that, I thought he was overreacting until I heard the same banging noise now coming from the door. It was more violent now. Everybody paused what they were doing and looked at the door in shock. One guest broke the silence and said it was probably only the pizza delivery man. But my friend told me not to answer the door at all costs. I looked through the peephole, and there he was. The same guy I saw through the bathroom's window. He had a psychotic looking face and was licking his lips nonstop. We all just stood there in silence and hoped that the man would go away. But after a few minutes, the loud noise came from the basement. The guy threw a brick at the basement's window and crawled through it. Suddenly, it sounded as if a gunshot echoed through the entire house. My friend and most of the party goers screamed and ran out of the house. I stayed behind along with a few others. One of the older kids was trained in martial arts, so I saw him assault and attack the man until he was shot. Afterward, the man escaped and ran into the woods. The whole scene was chaotic now. An ambulance and police car arrived soon after, and fortunately, the kid that was shot survived. After a few days of intense investigation, the police went to my friend's house and told him that they caught the guy. It turns out that he was living in the woods. He also kidnapped three kids, but luckily they were found in time and set free. But they also found out that he had already killed a few kids already. So after that, he was condemned to death for murder. This happened a while back when I was 11. We used to live in a two-story house, with the second floor being a wooden floor. There's a slight crack on the floor, so if anyone steps on it, it creaks. And one night, I woke up at around 1 a.m. The moment I opened my eyes, I heard heavy footsteps behind me as my body was facing the wall. 
My bed was next to the wall, and my computer was by my head. My door was always open since I never close it when I go to bed. At first, I was confused about why there were heavy footsteps with chains dragging on the floor. The heavy step sounded as if it stepped on the floor's crack. I heard the floor creak. The footsteps seemed to fade away to the end of the hallway to my uncle's room. It creeped me out and I couldn't move my body. I just stared at the wall in fear, then closed my eyes. Soon after, that noise came back to my room slowly. I heard the creak again and all of a sudden, the chains whipped the floor door. That sound was so loud, so I opened my eyes for a few seconds in fright, but closed it again. I said to myself that it was all a dream and it was nothing. It became silent until I heard a loud smash on the keyboard that's right by my head. I screamed, but kept closing my eyes forcefully. Suddenly, one of the deep voices started murmuring loudly just above my head. Its sound was so low beyond recognition, so I couldn't understand what the thing was. Then I started to pray to God. I was not honest and trustworthy back then, but praying was the only way to erase my fear. So I kept praying and surprisingly, the voice faded away. The next day, I told my family about what happened and they were surprised. I was given a rosary by a relative as protection and she told me not to take it off. So ever since then, I've been wearing it. However, just a month after that, around 3 a.m., I was sleeping and suddenly, my rosary fell and shattered into pieces on the floor. I jumped out of my bed immediately when it happened. I was so confused, but I didn't want to check on what could have caused it. So I decided to go back to sleep and just collect the scattered pieces of the rosary when I woke up. The next morning, I told my family about it again, and they got really scared because it was really unusual. But they couldn't do anything about it, so they just tried to cheer me up. Nothing has really happened since then, but I always wonder what would have happened if I opened my eyes to look right above my head to see who or what that deep voice was. This happened a couple of years ago. One night, my mom decided to hang out with her friends at a casino, and my dad was at work. So my two older sisters and I were home by ourselves. My sisters were 14 and 15 at the time, and I was 11. After my mom left, it was pretty exciting to be home by ourselves, but an hour later, it got boring. So we decided to play a game. We ended up playing hide and seek. At that point, I was a bit scared because it was 11 p.m., almost midnight. But then I kind of brushed it off since I thought my dad would come home soon. I didn't want to admit that I was scared. Also, I don't want to be home alone, so I decided to play. Let's just play hide and seek in the backyard, I suggested, but she refused. There are no hiding spots back there, let's go to the forest, my sister said. After my sister said that, shivers went down my spine. But anyway, we stepped into the forest that's nearby. Go count, my second older sister said to me. I decided that I had to be brave. My other sister gave me a blindfold. What is this for? I asked. Put it on and try to find us, my sister said. While my sisters used flashlights to find a place to hide, I put the blindfold on and then counted to 30. When it was time, I said, ready or not, here I come. After walking around, touching every tree I walked by, 10 minutes had already passed and I still hadn't found my sisters. Even while I was walking on this trail, I could barely see anything, so I tripped on a twig and fell. My clothes got dirty and my knees started bleeding. 
but I had no choice. I got up and walked around some more. I came across a tree and knew I finally found something. It felt like a person. Haha, <laughs> found you! I said. I then heard my sisters walking by behind me, saying, Hey, how did you not find us yet? At that moment, I froze. I took off my blindfold slowly and saw an old man sitting there smiling at me while holding a knife. Can't I play with the all? He asked with a cracking voice. He wore a dirty shirt and his hair seemed like he didn't shower for a long time. My sisters and I screamed and started running out of the forest as quickly as we could. While running, I looked back and noticed the man chasing after us while holding the knife, swinging it in the air. He was laughing like a mad person. I've never felt that kind of fear before. But after running for a while, the old man couldn't keep up. He stopped running, stared at us, and then he turned around and went back into the forest. We got closer to our house and then we saw our dad pulling into the driveway. We ran to him and told him what just happened. He was shocked, so he called the police immediately. The police went to the forest and they searched those areas for a few hours. After a while, they found and arrested the old man. The next day, we learned that the old man killed four female children and dumped their bodies in the woods. All the local news stations were covering the incident. When I heard that, I felt sick to my stomach. I am glad that we are safe, but now I pray for the four souls of the children. May they rest in peace. I have a sister who got married when she was 18. She had a daughter named Susie. Her husband was unemployed. She had to work two jobs to support herself, her daughter, and her husband. Every day, she left the house at 8 a.m. and she only returned around 8 p.m. every night. Around this time, Susie had an imaginary friend. She told my sister it was a little girl named Disica. Susie would talk about her all the time. My sister even overheard her talking to Disica. It creeped her out and after a while, she told Susie she was forbidden to talk about the girl. We weren't allowed to mention Disica when we came over to visit. One day, Susie told her mom, Disica is mad at you because you don't believe she's real. She comes to play with me when daddy closes the closet door after you leave and he lets us out before you come home. My sister had no idea this was happening. Her husband was supposed to be watching Susie during the day. Instead, he would lock her in the closet with a box of cereal and leave her there all day. When my sister discovered what was going on, she kicked her husband out. The poor little girl spent so much time all alone, locked in a closet that she had conjured up an imaginary playmate for herself. My sister divorced her husband and got custody of Susie. She decided to move out of the house they were renting. When the moving van came, the old man who owned the house came over to help them. He was talking to my sister and said, I was always worried about your little girl on those basement stairs. My granddaughter fell down those basement stairs and broke her neck. She died in front of the closet down there. When she heard that, my sister got the chills. What was her name, she asked. It wasn't Desica, it was it? The old man looked at her and said her name was Jessica. She was only four years old. She couldn't say it properly. And how did you know that's how she said her name, Desica? How did you know? My sister was in denial. She told him she didn't know what he was talking about. She refused to talk about it, grabbed the last of her things and left the house for good. Even today, we're still not allowed to talk about Susie and her imaginary friend, Disica. My sister remarried a few years later and Susie got her a great new stepdad. But Susie, when we speak alone, she always brings up that little girl and what she looked like. And it still creeps me out to this day because I don't really believe in that type of stuff with ghosts and paranormal, but 
There's no way that Susie could have known about that little girl. But who knows? Maybe they are real. And maybe not. Every night, I hear my mother through the walls. But she never talks during the day, only at night. Like clockwork, she begins at midnight and abruptly stops at 6 a.m. I've heard everything, from harsh whispers, playful talking, cackling, and even screaming. Some of the things I hear her say frighten me. It's about dark and dreadful things. Whenever I enter her room to check on her, the silence is there. She just rocks in her chair. This is enough. I can't take it anymore. My mom has been suffering from seizures for the past few years, and they're getting worse. The doctor told me that she needed full-time care, so I volunteered. Even though she has always been estranged and I hadn't seen her in a decade, I knew she needed me. So I kind of thought it might be my last chance to stay with her. But it's gotten too much. She scares me. She doesn't even eat. I've tried and tried, but she doesn't open her mouth. I've tried to get her out of her bedroom, or at least out of her chair, but she gets aggressive. So whenever she needs a bath, I bathe her right where she sits. She just rocks in her chair, mindlessly smiling at her closet. She does this all day. I have no idea what I have to do next. I'm about to go insane. I can handle caring for her during the day, but at night, I can't anymore. So I finally went to the doctor for some help. I told him that she's been keeping me up at night with her whispering and talking. And I also told him that it's getting too much and she's starting to scare me. But his facial expression while looking towards me was weird. He stared at me like he didn't understand what I was talking about. And what the doctor said next scared me even more. Well, I think you had a bad dream. Your mother bit her tongue off a few years ago. She can't talk at all. It happened when I was around 11 years old. One day, I was at my friend Kenzie's house. My other friend Emma joined us too. It was a lazy weekend, so we decided to kill some time by baking cookies and doing other things. We all gathered in Kenzie's room and did our geometry homework, which was the main reason we were all there. But soon after, we got bored doing it since we were young teenage girls. So we jumped on the bed, watched YouTube and Netflix, and told each other scary stories. The one I'll never forget is Kenzie's story. She told me a story that kept me paranoid for the rest of my stay at the house. She told us the owner of the house was found murdered in this house, and she sometimes feels like someone lives in her closet. A few hours later, Kenzie's parents said that they were going to a party and wouldn't be back until 6 in the morning. Kenzie didn't want to spend the night with her grandma and little sister, so she suggested that we should have a sleepover. It sounded like a great idea, so we just called each of our parents and it took a lot of convincing to have the sleepover. When we got permission, we all changed into Kenzie's pajamas got in bed and watched something scary. It was almost 8 p.m. Kenzie's room was so messy, it almost looked like a pig's pen, so we decided that we would record a time lapse of us cleaning. We were in the middle of cleaning the room when the doorbell suddenly rang. It was our pizza delivery. We all forgot to turn the camera off and left to eat. We just sat in the living room, ate and talked for a while. After we finished eating the pizza, we went back to her room. I realized that we left the camera on. But as I reached to grab my phone, I felt something. 
I was anxious, even though her room was very silent. So I told my friends to come closer. We all stood there and watched the video. As soon as we left, the window opened slowly. There was a man who came inside, and then he ran into the bathroom. We all froze, knowing that someone was in the bathroom, which was connected to this room, but tried not to make any noise. Then, Kenzie told us that we should all leave this room, so we did just that. We went to her grandma's room with her little sister. We immediately locked the door, called the police and Kenzie's parents. Thankfully, the police arrived in less than five minutes. When they arrived at the house, they went to Kenzie's room and found the man. Near the sink was a gun and a pocket knife, and they arrested him. It turns out that he was put in jail last week for raping young girls and then murdering them. But he escaped prison and tried to find another victim. I couldn't help but imagine what would have happened if I didn't look at the footage on my camera. To this day, I hate going to sleepovers. Now I'm 16 and I heard that the man escaped again after killing the security guards. I hope he's not looking for me or my friends. This story takes place in South Africa, my home country. It happened last year during July, right after I turned 18. I had a three-week holiday before I had to go back to school, and my sister decided to take me and a few friends to KwaZulu-Natal for a trip to a mountain range. It was me, my sister called Kate, and my three friends, Ashley, May, and Hannah. The last place we visited before we went to the cold mountain range was called Izandalwana, where the Shaka Zulu army fought Britain with many fatalities. We got to the place at around midnight since there was no security, so we decided to explore the grounds and look at the thousands of graves placed around the land. It wasn't until after I asked to give it a rest and find a place to stay for the night that my sister pulled a box out of her bag. It was the infamous Ouija board. We used to believe in the paranormal side of the world, so all five of us decided to play. I mean, it was such a perfect place to do it. So we sat down by one of the bigger graves and started playing. But the board wasn't really doing anything until my sister lost her temper and took her fingers off. The key started moving around in short circles before going over the letters and spelling out R-U-N-T-H-E-Y-A-R-E-H-E-R-E. -E -E -E. Run. They are here. At first, we were all kind of laughing. We weren't really scared because we'd had a crap ton of alcohol before playing the game and thought it was one of the girls doing it. However, all of a sudden, Ashley stood up, cried out in pain, and she claimed something was stabbing her. Help! Help me! She screamed, so we immediately stopped playing and went to help her. When she lifted up her shirt, we could see a long and deep scratch that went from where her heart is down to her stomach. We were all shocked, so we left the place in a hurry since the nearest clinic was over an hour away. When we arrived, our situation only got worse considering we were a group of white girls who only knew how to speak English and a bit of Dutch while everyone inside of the clinic was a Zulu native and didn't know any English. We couldn't get my friend any help, since neither we nor the nurses understood each other until we lifted up my friend's shirt to show them the wound. We felt so stuffy and eventually one nurse sterilized her and bandaged her up. However, surprisingly, the next morning when we woke up inside of my sister's van, 
She was no longer wounded, and it was as if the event didn't even happen. Someone later told us that it might be a Zulu trademark to cut their enemies' hearts from their gut in respect of the body they had killed, preparing them for the afterlife. But who knows? Now, over a year later, none of us truly know what happened. I go to university, and they are still my only friends. The memory becomes more and more distant over time, and I sometimes believe that we all just hallucinated. But the one thing for sure is that I will never ever touch the Ouija board again.